If there's one man who can help, if there's one man who can help, it's a man coming in here right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Full Metal Alchemist Fan Guide that is looking at the 2003 anime series as part of Full Metal Friday. Roughly about 52 episodes of the series if we include the movie, so theoretically that's one episode for each week of the series, although I do sometimes record reviews for a couple episodes in one recording uh, so that I can kind of uh, stay roughly on track if I miss a week or two. Usually you can expect these on... Fridays, Eastern Standard Time, around 9, 9.30 p.m., all part of a podcast made full metal. Today we'll be looking at episode 46, Human Transmutation. And once again, the synopses for this one, because sometimes I <laughs> I look at the uh, little summaries there online to kind of give me an idea for a starting point, but I just watched this one very fresh, so a lot of it stuck with me because I feel like it was a lot of plot, but not really a lot of details, basically... Tucker decides, you know, to make a deal with Alphonse, saying that, hey, if you let me use the power of the stone that's within you, because the stone was transmuted into his armored body, you know, to bring Nina back to life, to do human transmutation, hence the title, he will teach him basically how to use it so that he can get Ed's body back, because he still really wants to just basically help his brother, you know, has that strong loyalty to him, as he always does. Then, basically, Lust, of course, was sent really by Dante to go after Ed. And apparently, you know, the idea is that all of the, the, all of this current conflict, which is going on with the nearby country of Drogma, is just going to be another war, really to kind of cover up anything that has anything to do with Hughes. So Dante's trying to cover her tracks, as well as trying to find, I guess, more ways to Potentially use the Philosopher's Stone and find people who she can manipulate as well. So she's continuing on her plans, but this particular war is a way to kind of cover her tracks now that people know that Sloth might not actually be, a, you know, this person who was in the military administration. Speaking of which, Sloth actually tracks Al down, finding out that, you know, he was working with Tucker, and actually points out that uh, Al may be deteriorating. So it kind of leaves with a pretty uh, b- blatant cliffhanger of, ooh, you know, uh, what's going to happen to Al? Because maybe every time the stone is used, it literally gets worn away, hence kind of equivalent exchange. So I'll admit, because uh, we've gotten to the point here with these last couple episodes, I remember how the series ends, but the few episodes before it, I I uh, don't remember very well. I, I actually am kind of wondering if I did see them, because, I don't know, I, I remember... Because I, I, this episode seemed familiar, but I, I remember, well, we, I, I saw a lot of Full Metal Alchemist on Adult Swim years ago, uh, but I didn't, I, I like, I saw, like, the second half of the series kind of first, and then saw different episodes, I guess, in random order, but I didn't have cable for a very long time, so what I typically did was I would go to, I think it was, like, uh, Best Buy uh, had the a lot of times Funimation would release DVDs, kind of like they did with the VHSs for things like Pokemon and and Dragon Ball, you know, buying like different different DVDs that had a couple episodes per, and I would kind of catch up that way to make sure that, you know, I could see episodes I'd missed. So that's actually how I had most of the series and seen most of it, and I had most of those DVDs somewhere. I don't know where they are now. Uh, I'm sure they're worth more, uh, even though it makes more sense to get a box set. But I specifically remember, I think I did see the end of the series, but... Honestly, I think there might have been a disc or two I didn't see. I think it was only one, but I I do think that I might have missed a couple episodes like right before the end. So I'm wondering, I'm honestly wondering if I've seen this one before. It looks, I I maybe I saw it when I rewatched it at some other point. I because I feel like the the scenes were very similar. Like I, I it seemed familiar, but I don't know. So yeah, like I said, we've gotten to a point where I'm not hundred percent sure how well I remembered it. So it felt very fresh to me, uh, but I really enjoyed it. So uh, past the synopsis now, just kind of moving on to my overall feelings for it. I think there's some really positive aspects to the writing that are being shown here for sure. Uh, I think that a lot of things are sort of coming full circle. 
there's kind of a balance uh, kind of leading to really a reprise of the earliest episodes. We're kind of revisiting a lot of our roots, kind of, you know, it's almost nostalgic within watching the series, which I think is kind of good. It speaks to sort of a, a kind of an interesting flow, almost musically to the writing and, and poetically. You could say it's like they rhyme, as George Lucas would put it. So I really I really like how delicate and sophisticated it's trying to be with that that balance of connecting the storylines and trying to sort of resolve things, even little things really that were so big in the beginning of the series. It is getting wrapped up here. Particularly, I mean, the Tucker and Nina stuff, I mean, arguably, I would say that that stuff is probably the thing that Fulmer Alchemist is best known for. I mean, other than like the very general stuff about, you know, the alchemical powers and transmutations and uh, just the the homunculi as villains. I think that really the Tucker Nina stuff is is like the biggest thing. I feel like if people haven't seen Fulmer Alchemist, they know about that. There's you know, often, if, if nothing else, there's memes about it and things like that. So, yeah, it, so, so I think it's kind of appropriate that we kind of go back because early on, those were sort of foundational to the brothers sort of growing in their first exposure to, you know, a father figure who was, you know, somebody they looked up to seeing that alchemy could, you know, be used inappropriately in pursuit of something that you might want, if theoretically doing some good and the twisted nature of that. So, kind of really getting to explore Tucker more and see him from a different angle, I think was really a, a really good way to kind of see that. I always love more of Tucker. There also was kind of the really strong reveal, kind of finally, really quickly, actually, that's been implied a lot of Envy's origin, that Hohenheim created him, and that might have been based, you know, on... We Actually, I know that the reveal of it being his son hasn't happened yet, but it's kind of like, oh, wait, he was made made from what so he actually throws a tantrum and envy always has had like this disdain but i've always i I love envy as a villain because every line especially in the dub that that the actor gives just kind of oozes this venom but it's like this syrupy quality to the voice where it's like mm, like it's delicious and everything that they're saying whenever they're mentioning some sort of phrase regarding their hatred towards the Ed, edward and uh, elric the elric brothers and really just humans in general. I feel like Envy has always sort of been, at least to me, the best representation of the homunculi's hatred, at least in the first series. I do like Envy in Brotherhood too, but once again, kind of a different character and, you know, slightly different function. But I I love how Envy kind of is like Ed's arch enemies, <laughs> arch enemies, arch enemy, arch nemesis in this series, uh, in, the, in the first anime. And I, I just really love that performance. But here we see with the reveal of the origin that Envy really loses his cool and throws a tantrum. We see how strong, like, I don't know if we've, I can't remember watching it. Have we really seen, I mean, we know how obviously resistant he is to damage like the rest of the homunculi, basically immortal. Uh, and of course has the shape shifting and is very quick, very agile, a lot of good fighting skills, but strong. Like he's punching craters into the, into the ground. Like it's just, it was, it, was, it was kind of almost funny, but it just clearly shows there's something that's gotten under his skin. So I, I like seeing that little aspect of his character that finally Envy really, really loses his cool. Uh, really shows that, that real hatred there, and it's almost to the point where he can't control it. Uh, and I also like there's kind of a conversation I'll talk about in a little bit that also bringing things full circle, there's a lot of mentioning about those big themes of the series of just what it really means to be human and kind of tying that into what we use to identify as human relating to our physical form and at what point are you not considered human and the concept of the soul and you know kind of what makes you you and have consciousness and be unique individual and what people are willing to do to fight for that idea once again a lot of these through lines of the series that not exactly the most subtle i mean literally ed kind of taunts wrath about it but I'm glad we're bringing it up because it's still powerful stuff and it's once again connected directly to not only the main themes of the show, one of them that it's been talking about, tying into those big ideas from early on. Leading into my favorite full metal moment, I think honestly was really just Lust's conversation with Ed uh, when he asks her why she wants to become human because she basically betrays the others and says, hey, you know, uh, if you if I help you, will you use the philosopher's stone to make me human? And Ed doesn't really understand. He asks her, 
like I don't really get it. You know, you I don't, I don't know what to believe you. Basically, you're immortal. You're pretty much indestructible. You don't age. You know, and you've got all these great, you know, these powers. So you're really better off than a human. And she just, you know, delivers that line of, well, what have you been doing this whole time trying to get your brother's body back, even though he's technically human, right? It's the same thing. So it's just, you know, the the very tangible uh, physical attributes of being human and that famili- familiarity and maybe a certain degree of wanting to be accepted and considered normal and have that, that human connection, uh, b- maybe being able to be close to somebody and feel like you can fit in because... Also, I think with the the homunculi, you know, there's the lack of the souls, that lack of feeling genuine, like they aren't really their own person. They're just living off of the memory or shadow or echo of someone else. So it's it's like they can never truly be human, even if they were technically kind of human anyway. So I, I think that's interesting. I think Lust is a fascinating character, and she's really become much more tragic and, and I, I think very complicated. I find her very interesting. Uh, even though I think that not a lot of it really gets resolved, and we kind of know a lot of her motivations anyway, I still find her to be one of the most interesting characters in the show, and I understand why she really is a fan favorite. And once again, for people who maybe like Brotherhood more, uh, that's perfectly fine, but a lot of people who like Lust in Brotherhood but have not seen the show or haven't given the first anime a chance, like... If you liked Lust just because of her aesthetic and how badass of a fighter she is, I mean, the tragic, layered, really uh, you know, emotional reverberating of just all these different ideas uh, from this particular character in this version of the story, it's just it's so good. I mean, she's just such a, she's a really good character and she's like, she can, in one moment she can be really scary and then she can also be incredibly sad and you, you really feel for her though. And I like how there's that incredible balance. I also love how Ed's using the the remains of the body. So when when he literally just kind of puts it on her claw, she just completely becomes stiff. You know that that sort of rigor, kind of like Greed had. Literally, the same thing happens where they just like she completely freezes. She has no ability to move, and it's just it's uh, really really drastic and jarring. Uh, I also kind of like how Wrath is sort of really becoming his own villain. He's just really diving once again into sort of being just that really evil kid uh that really really just hates hates ed as well but he he still is very different he's almost like a rabid animal uh it's great <laughs> yeah I, so i enjoy that uh yeah i i like the reprise like i said about tucker and nina i think i think that stuff was pretty good as well um uh, and i i'd see i i liked how uh, well, oh yeah one thing i thought was interesting is Dante actually mentions that Bradley is, well, once again, she created uh, pride as well as she created greed. And that the thing that was specific about having uh, Bradley in as the Fuhrer, he could stand in for long periods of time because he actually ages. So he is closer to being human, perhaps, than the other homunculi, which is, I believe, similar to kind of the how Wrath was Bradley in Brotherhood. So kind of once I'm wondering if they were getting hints about the manga and following that and and kind of picking and choosing little things to just insert there while the manga was going on, even though they were doing their own thing. Um, And I also really kind of going along with that, like I really like the insight we get into Dante a bit here when Ed talks to Izumi. And I think once again, Izumi is a great character, too. And uh, there's that brief flashback where. Dante mentions she has such disdain for humans and she hates them so much, which might explain why she feels she can do all these things, <laughs> um, which I think implies she hates herself in some way. I was, you know, because Azumi kind of throws that back at her like, well, I'm human, you're human. And she asks, like, yeah, have you ever loved anybody but yourself? And of course, she did once with Hohenheim. And I guess that didn't work out with the betrayal. And she said, well... I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, so I, I find that interesting because I, I, I know that that was kind of Dante's perspective. and But I always kind of thought it was a bit pettier than that. And obviously she's kind of using this philosophy to justify just kind of using humans as tools just as a means to an end so that she can just have immortality and just ha- have all these incredible enjoyments uh, in, in life continuously. And doesn't she doesn't care about really who she hurts along the way. So the thing that 
fascinates me about that is that's basically father's perspective, a different origin, slightly different motivations, but their general feelings and, and perspectives are the same. So that's why I've always kind of said, you know, kind of reemphasizing something that I've often said about talking about the two shows is that really there are a lot of differences in the tone and the presentation and, and some of the plot for sure. But the big ideas, the big themes, even really the villains aren't that much different on a fundamental level. They're just kind of doing it for the, what they're doing for different reasons, but they, they have the same perspective. It's just, I've always kind of thought that, I mean, Brotherhood, I'm, I'm not trying to make this into a full comparison, but it, since we're getting more into Dante, I think it's fair. Brotherhood's always seems so grandiose with its plot, and it's just much this bigger epic thing. And of course, this first anime has this, quieter story that i remembered which i've always thought that intimate kind of grounded sensibility just kind of makes it more relatable in a way and dante is doing what she's doing partially for revenge it seems which i never thought about really it's kind of to stick it at hohenheim kind of like maybe throwing his own practices against him uh, kind of being also something to haunt him which also is kind of what father did literally being sort of a reflection of him in a way. So I don't know. I, I find it interesting how she does it for petty reasons, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, there are, are more layers to that as well. So yeah, I, whew, uh, I, I thought there were some really good lines of this, some really good delivery from the dub, uh, just a lot of things going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I really, really enjoyed a lot of that stuff there. I, I also think Tucker, I love, I love seeing Tucker again, you know, like I, Anyone that knows my channel should know that I am a big fan of Tucker as a villain. I, I always really liked him, mostly from this series. I, and I think, not not to heart belabor a point, I'm kind of bringing up certain points I made before, particularly in the video I made about Lust a little while ago, if you want to check that out. It, I, I think that Lust is a great example of the strengths of this show that people might overlook if they just watch Brotherhood. But Tucker as well. And I, I and I think that, you know, Tucker is certainly iconic for the same basic reasons in the manga, but they explore it so much here and they go such a creepy, weird, mad scientist, body horror direction with him. I mean, that whisper, you know, I, I love, I love it. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's good voice acting on my part, but I just, I just, I love that, that creepiness to him. But once again, the the really the the complex nature of these characters and the fact that they seem so relatable and so human is just i remember uh, when i was talking to walking double o dead about it uh, just you know, oftentimes we had conversations just the big cast of characters whether they're more integral to the story or their side characters they just all really stand out so well and there are a few anime that i have seen where the ensemble cast just are all memorable all have little aspects to their personality that make them seem so believable and likable. And even a villain like Tucker, like, I feel bad for him. Like, in this one, he he I know he's done some evil things, but he is trying, albeit still the wrong way, he is trying to make up for his mistake. He's trying to bring his daughter back. And, oh man, when, you know, he does sort of succeed with the transmutation, he makes the the body of you know, basically a perfect human without any flaws, but it's still missing the soul. It's not really his daughter. It's just this empty husk. And Sloth just kind of, you know, says, oh, well, you're just weak-willed. So no matter what, even though he's got the Philosopher's Stone, he can't succeed. And at that moment, he just seems like totally lost. It's really, it's really sad. <laughs> it's really tragic. And I, I don't think it really goes much further for him. So, you know, for that alone, I think, Man, this episode just, this episode was really good, which is <laughs> fitting because I came to the score segment. I'm trying to be a little more uh, <laughs> consistent with my segues, uh, more so than usual. Uh, but man, uh, it seems like there was a lot of stuff moving at a rapid pace in this episode. Almost like maybe the writers are like, we have to wrap this up soon. So we just got to throw some little plot points here and there. But it doesn't waste time. Uh, they even they're even hinting at Archer being alive, and I know, I know Robot Archer's coming, which I know is probably silly. I remember uh, I was watching a video. I think it was uh, the channel was Low Ward, I believe. It was uh, he does really good videos, uh, and he mentioned how much he hated it. 
Uh, and I'm like, you know what? I don't even care. I love Archer as a villain. I should do a video about him because he is an underrated villain. I like him. And I know he comes back as a robot. And I know it's going to be stupid. But it's awesome. <laughs> it's just awesome. So I don't know. I'm really tem- I was really tempted to give this episode a 10. Because I just I really, really liked it. So I got a 9 here officially. But you know what? I, I'm going to give it a 10. I really liked this episode. So this this was a joy to watch again. Uh, a lot of good stuff. Just a lot of great reminders of why I love this series and why it's affected a lot of people and touched them so well and and brought them together and you know brought people here to to listen to me talk about it again. <laughs> so it's it's been really cool rewatching these. So yeah, that was episode forty six, human transmutation. So please let me know your thoughts about this episode below. Anything I may have missed. Anything you might agree or disagree with. You know, like it, please, you know, share it if you can. Helps the algorithm and all that stuff, spread it around. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all the all the support. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm mostly on schedule. So I'm going to try to uh, get to the last couple episodes here. So a couple more weeks and we'll be, we're racing, you know, a couple more till we get to the, fin- fin- the final finale. The finale, I know we're going to get to the whole different universe thing and uh, eventually we'll talk about the movie so uh, like i said might i might do some different things here uh for the last couple episodes uh, just to mix it up i don't know uh we'll see but um in the meantime everybody thank you for listening and stay magical